So basically on our podcast, on this episode, we, we kind of did like a spotlight on the Dis- your Disincarnate project, the album Dreams of the Carrying Kind. And uh, it was really cool to us. Uh, you know, we had not heard that before. And so it was a huge surprise. We were kind of blown away. Like, how could an album, you know, this good had passed us by? And the hosts on the co- podcast were a little younger. So, you know, we weren't there for it when it came out. So that may be part of the reason. But, yeah. you know, when I was doing some yeah. research, a lot of people, you know, this is an underrated classic or people that, you know, some of our listeners are really surprised by it. So I guess, is that a common thing that you get? You know, people are still discovering this album? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely still a lot of discovery for this album. And it's gone through a few stages of that. And, you know, at each point, there's usually been some sort of re-release, uh, reissuing of it. Um, it's my understanding that Listenable is about to reissue it on vinyl, at least I don't know about CD. I know they're going to do a vinyl reissue. Okay. Um, I wasn't put into the loop on that re-release at all, and I'm going to be reaching out to them to sort of find out. I think it's kind of too late for me to have any <laughs> sort of contribution at all to yeah. the liner notes or to the, you know, or, yeah. or just anything. They just completely failed to reach out to me. So I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a bit wary of this re- reissue. I have no idea what was done to the audio, huh. whether I approve of it or anything, you know, so... Yeah, that's kind of lame. To get back to the yeah, to get back to the question at hand, you know, I, I uh, I've definitely noticed that throughout the years, uh, young people always seem to be discovering it from one one way or another. Of course, mm-hmm. online is a, you know a big way people discover it these days. They find it on their you know illegal sites and all that stuff. But you know, just even through iTunes and through uh, the uh, various reissues over the years, there's only been a couple. There was the original issue, then the very next issuance of it I'm even aware of is I think about 2005 Roadrunner themselves reissued it on CD and uh, uh, I remastered it and I added the uh, three demo tracks mm-hmm. and a lot of new people discovered it from that as you know a lot of a lot of young young people you know and uh, I've been pretty impressed with young metal crowds you know there's always a very strong contingent within the metal community of young people coming into it that go back and kind of do their research, mm-hmm. you know? And that reminds me of me when I was a kid, you know, like when I got into, you know, Black Sabbath and I would, I, I think I got into them on like Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. And I went back and found all the old records, which was a lot harder to do back then. And, and if I, I got into a band like say, for instance, you know, Iron Maiden and, you know, Bruce Dickinson mentioned Samson or something. I went back and found those records you right. know, that he sang on with them. And uh, so I, I did my research and I found the stuff from the previous Previous time, you know, when I, I remember, yeah. uh, you know, I think I was reading, uh, uh, I forget who I was reading. I kind of grew up with Hendrix, so he's not really a good example. But, you know, like uh, an example would be like if, for instance, I were reading, you know, an Ingve article and he mentioned Hendrix and I went back and discovered Hendrix, you know, oh, yeah. something from 20 years, you know, 15, 20 years earlier. And uh, kids still do that, which I think is pretty great. Yeah, it's part. I mean, it's part of the fun for it for me. I mean, yeah. when I was younger, you know, the liner notes and the CDs, or nowadays, you know, online interviews, whatever, and just you know, just kind of going down the rabbit hole. When you uh, when you sat down to start the project back way back, you know, ninety three. I know you know. Obviously, everybody. Well, I started started the project well before ninety three. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? When did you start I, working I, on I it? Actually, I actually started working on it in. I started writing slowly writing music. I didn't have a lot of time to sit around and write tunes, but I, I slowly wrote the first three tunes, maybe the first four, something like that, um, and a bunch of other odds and end riffs starting in probably late 1990. Okay, okay. Mid to mid to late 1990, shortly after I got off the road, death. Okay, right. You know, uh, you know I did, Spiritual Healing was the first album I ever played on. And then I toured with the band for you know, about six weeks or something like that, to all told. And uh, then then I, I left. And so right about then, and I, I jo- immediately joined Obituary, but I also immediately started working on my own material. Okay. Now, did you have to, did you use any of that for Obituary? That material uh, that you no, were writing? No, no. See, yeah, well, when I came into Death, I uh, uh, when I joined Death, I, uh, you know, I was sort of a blank slate writing-wise. I hadn't been writing anything. Mm-hmm. And so when they played me the four songs they already had, because I, I co-wrote uh, on half the album for Spiritual Healing, for the Death Spiritual Healing album that right. came out in 1990, um, they had four songs completed, pretty much completed, except for like solo sections and stuff and some of the lyrics. When I arrived 
uh, but the arrangements and all the riffs were put together. And so then uh, I immediately started co-writing the remaining four songs for the album with those guys, particularly me and Chuck, you know, Terry had some contributions as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when Chuck would ask me if I had, a, Oh, you know, I got this rift, you got a part that maybe can connect to this, you know, maybe be like a bridge to, you know, or maybe would be, you know, Hey, I got this as a verse. You got something that could be a chorus or just anything like that. And he would present it to me and I would just kind of usually just make up something on the spot. I, I very rarely had anything, you know, prepared, but because of that, I really wrote in their style. Okay, it was just, sure. it was right in front of me. I had just learned four songs. I was a blank slate writing wise. And so when Chuck played me a riff, I wrote something that was a reaction to that riff right on, on the spot. So it very much sounded like death. It sounded like spiritual healing. It, it just really, really fit. But because I started, when I joined Obituary, their album was written. I mean, I, I, I went right into the studio and played my solos before I even learned how to play any of the songs myself. Okay, sure. And, uh, you know, shortly after we, I mean, right after we finished recording the album, we started rehearsing and I started learning the songs, but I was also already writing. But because I wasn't writing for Obituary, I just wrote whatever I felt like writing. You okay. Know, I was I wasn't reacting to like say for instance Trevor saying, "Hey, I got this, you know, chorus riff where you got like a, you know, a verse for this or something, you know?" Like yeah. or, And so I, that didn't happen, you know. So I wasn't like coming up with something that was a an immediate reaction to what I was being played. I was I was instead just creating out of thin air for myself. And so it started coming out with the, I started writing the disincarnate riffs. And uh, it really had nothing to do with obituary. It didn't sound like obituary at all. So when Trevor eventually did, you know, say to me, hey, you got some riffs. We need to, you know, we're possibly going to go ahead and start thinking about writing some stuff. What do you got? You got any riffs, got any songs? You know, it was kind of like they just wanted to see whether I was, whether I had stuff that fit obituary. Well, mm -hmm. the only material I had was disincarnate riffs. And I played it for Trevor and his reaction was, well, that sounds cool, but uh, it's not obituary. Yeah. And I was different. like, yeah, it just doesn't fit of intro. I don't even think he made an attempt to learn any of them. <laughs> he was just like, yeah, that doesn't really sound like a bitchery. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know? <laughs> right. It really, it really doesn't. And I said, you know, I, and I said, well, the way I wrote with Chuck was he played me something and I, I came up with my reaction to it. You know, when we do that, I'll be able to write in a way that mm -hmm. fits. But if I'm just creating out of a, you know, out of a vacuum, you know, myself in a room, I'm not going to write an obituary song. I'm going to write a James Murphy slash disincarnate song because that's yeah. what I ended up doing. So I decided right then and there that the ideas I had already tooling around in my head about, you know, starting my own band as like a side project to obituary, I decided I definitely was going to do it. And I also realized right about then that it probably wasn't going to be a, a side project. You okay. Know, that, it, that it probably was going to be, you know, I wasn't making any, you know, evil plans to, to quit obituary or anything, but, uh, I already had sort of a feeling that the writing was on the wall, you know, mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. like, okay, they, I think that that was just a test, you know, he wanted to see if I could write and being, I did, I didn't pull some riffs out of my butt that sounded exactly like obituary at the moment. You know, he's probably made up his mind now that I can't write obituary style, mm. but you know, like I said, the way I would have been able to do that would have been in the room with them, in the room with them immersed in it. I totally would have been able to write that style, but yeah, you know, we already were, you know, feeling each other out you know they're they're great guys and in a cool band but we were very different types of people you know yeah yeah and sure. uh and clearly when i wrote what i really wanted to write it sounded nothing like that so you know i knew the writing was on the wall at that point yeah yeah so you basically had started compiling a couple songs um, mm -hmm. on your own, and then you got the yep. guys together and kind of went from there. Yeah, it was sort of a long, drawn out course. Like that was that was 1990, probably that that happened with, mm -hmm. with Trevor, and uh, I spent the the rest of '92 putting together the band, moving to Tampa, getting an apartment in Tampa, putting together the band because I had been living in Lakeland, uh, which is you know something I don't know, like about 30 miles, 35, 40 miles away from Tampa. Okay. Sure. Um, and so I moved into Tampa and I, uh, found the band members and I, uh, started working on the deal, you know, getting a deal. And so we signed a demo deal with Roadrunner and that's when I, you know, I, I hadn't found the drummer yet. So I snagged, I really only found the singer and a bass player 
who didn't actually make it to the album, but I found a singer and I didn't have a drummer. So I borrowed uh, Alex Marquez from Malevolent Creation Mm -hmm. and Solstice. And uh, he played the drums on the demo. And uh, so when you got took it from there, when you got these guys together and, and when you were kind of putting some of the songs together yourself, were you setting out to do anything specific with it? You know, you know, you had a lot of different things going on in death metal. Did you have some ideas for where you wanted to take it or did it just come about? As you went, I had a pretty solid vision of what I wanted to do. I, I, I had it right down to just not only the, you know, the sonic, the sonic palette, you know, but as also the visual aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to avoid many, not all, but many of the typical death metal subject matter. I wanted it to be pretty death metal, you know, because I. Number one, I still I was still pretty in love with the genre at that point. I it was very fun to play live. Very you know great connection with the fans. You know it's just powerful. It's fun yeah, to do. Yeah. You know because I got a lot of grief from the press. Like oh well you you know why are you doing just more death metal? You know you just mm. you know especially being the time that it was. You know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was you know <laughs> it, was, it was you know Nirvana and crap like that was starting <laughs> to come onto the scene. Of course they yeah. weren't really expecting me to do something like that, but they were looking for perhaps an evolution towards maybe something more, you know, jazzy or something. I don't sure, know. Like, sort yeah. of like, it's like death eventually did like cynic was doing, you know, a lot of these sure. bands, you know, started doing that sort of thing. I just wanted a very powerful, dark band with a, with a pretty broad palette, like, you know, where we could have kind of grindy bits, but we could have technical death metal bits. We could have just the really dark, dark, you know, just evil sounded stuff and, and yeah. doom, just full on doom parts. Exactly. Just, right. You know, the just, I, I wanted I wanted all that stuff. I mean, I I liked so many different styles in death metal myself that I didn't see why I couldn't incorporate all of those, you mm-hmm. know. And so yeah, that's really the only thing I was really thinking of was just like, you know, I don't want to just be like a doom band that's slow all the time. I don't mm-hmm. want to be a grindcore band. That it's not really never was my shtick. I wouldn't have, wouldn't you know. I mean, I loved a lot of those bands, but I I wasn't uh, you know from that. You know, yeah, yeah. I went from the crusty punks and, you know, go, going into grind core and all that stuff. I went, <laughs> none of that was, you know, where I was from, but I did love it. So, you know, I wanted to incorporate any vibe that I felt fit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, as I started putting the songs together and I realized we just had this whole, this very dark thread running through everything. I didn't want to screw it up by throwing in some you know, happy sounding part or, you know, yeah. jazz fusion, you know, or anything like that. So I just kept it really, uh, dark, you know, and, uh, and I, I wanted to avoid though, well, I didn't want to avoid the stylistic tropes of death metal. I wasn't trying to avoid those on the, of the musical, you know, style. Yeah. Typical things that you would hear in death metal. I did want to avoid a lot of the lyrical tropes. I didn't want gore. You know, mm-hmm. didn't want any mm-hmm. gore. I didn't want any satanic stuff. First of all, I'm not satanic. You'd have to you have to kind of believe in the Christian God in the first place to believe in Satan. Sure. I don't believe yeah. in any of that stuff. So yeah. none of that would have been true to me. I've always been really fascinated by psychological concepts and, and you know, the, just the state of, of the human condition, you know, um, socially and psychologically. Yeah. And also, I had uh, very much a, a reader. You know, and I loved a lot of the typical, maybe, and maybe here's where I, well, definitely here's where I probably dipped into some of the well-trodden ground already is that I was into, you know, we had some lyrics that were kind of loosely based on, you know, Hellraiser, a sea of tears, you know, okay, we, had, yeah. uh, we had some HP Lovecraft inspired stuff, uh, like, uh, entranced, uh, which was like kind of inspired by like his short stories, uh, the tomb and, uh, behind the wall of sleep. You know, yeah. But the rest of them were just sort of psychological, sort of the human, the dark side of the human social and psychological condition. Yeah. yeah. So a little, little different for the time, sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now I know you know one of the burning questions I'm sure you get a lot is if you're still planning on doing another album, and if you did, you know, wh- what would you want out of it? What would you want it to sound like? You know, that kind of thing. Well, I do want to do another one. It's actually been planned for like. 15 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've been thinking about it for the last 15 years. Wow. Or probably the first five years of that, I wasn't really in a good condition or position in life to do it. 
Yeah, with all you know, the health was, problems going on. Yeah, and for the last 10 years, it's really just, you know, I've been trying to build my business and, and, and have a life. Sure. Try to have a better life than I ever had when I was a musician, you know, full-time. Than when I, yeah. I was still a musician, but when I was a full-time musician, especially given the changes in the industry that, you know, started it, you know, more than a decade ago at this point. So, you know, I threw myself into the production and, you know, mixing and all of that sort of, you know, side of thing, yeah. side of things. And, uh, uh, it, it really just sort of became a, there's never time for it sort of thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, but now I'm kind of getting to where I should be able to do it. I mean, but I, I do, I do intend to do it and it's becoming more and more, it's coming more and more into focus. Okay. That it, that it, that it's a real thing that I'm going to do soon. First of all, not getting any younger. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, would love to make it happen while I would still be able to go out and do some shows, you know, okay, and, yeah. uh, and support it, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, 70 years old trying to do shows, you yeah. know? So, yeah. um, luckily I'm still a couple, you know, a few decades, you know, a couple decades <laughs> away from that, but, uh, yeah, I hear um, you though. Uh, but so, you know what I mean? It's, it's currently, I actually have two of the other three original members on board. Okay, that's not um, bad. I, you know, I think I mentioned that I had a bass player when, when we did the uh, the demo that got us to deal with Roadrunner. Right, um, yeah. He departed right after the demo, and uh, we decided not to replace him. Okay, and sure. I, I did the bass on the album. That's why you just see the four of us mm-hmm. on the album cover, if you, if you have the album cover, if you've mm-hmm. seen it online or whatever. We never had a, an official formal bass player. We had a guy we took on the road, but uh, he wasn't, you know, our permanent guy. He basically yeah. disappeared after that tour. I haven't heard from him since. Yeah. So out of those three guys, I got two of them currently. Okay. That yeah. uh, say they're down to do it, want to do it, and it's just a matter of uh, follow through at this point. Cool. Cool. Um, I wanted to go back for a minute to, you know, you're talking about death and playing with Chuck on spiritual healing. And um, I was listening to it a couple of times this week before we did this interview, just thinking about, you know, that album and, and what you had done on it. What was it like? You mentioned a little bit writing with Chuck. He would show, kind of show you something he had and you would kind of jump into it. What was yeah. it like writing with someone? I know he had such a, you know, he it seems like he had such a clear vision all the time. He had so much creative control. What was it like writing with someone like that? Was it mostly a smooth process? I honestly think that that's a reputation that he developed later on in his career. Okay. I don't think it was really so much the case on the, on the first three albums because you know I knew he you know he had co-writers on the previous two and certainly when I joined right away it was like oh cool man you know let's you know let's write this together you know what do you got you got mm. some riffs you know what I mean it was easy as cake it was so easy wow. There was nothing to it. And I honestly don't think that he rejected anything that I presented. Okay, wow. And, See, I wouldn't have expected that. And like I said, that. some of the times I was, I was literally, you know, he's like, hey, dude, you got a part that will go with this? You know, and he played me something, and I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would pick up my guitar, and I, I would just play the first thing, you know, yeah. whatever that part made me feel, I would just play it. Yeah. You know, I would just come up with it on the spot, you know. I mean, I know my intervals well enough. I hear something in my head. I can generally play it, you know? Yeah. And so I would just, however that, what he played me made me feel, I would hear it in my head. I would go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I might fall through a little bit the first couple of times, but he would hear what I was coming up with. And then as I, as I got it together and played it for him properly, you know, he would, uh, uh, if I didn't do it right off the bat, uh, he, he was usually like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. You know? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it was. You know, I mean, I understand that he had that reputation, but I I have to think that that part of it. I mean, you know, I'm I'm talking only about the writing, you know, side yeah. of things. And uh, but for me, when I was in death, the writing thing was super super simple. I mean, Terry jumped in there too. Terry had riffs. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know? cool. And he he contributed his his riffs as well, and it it went great. You know, it was so smooth, so much fun. We had so much fun during those writing sessions. It wasn't stressful at all stress didn't I mean, start really happening until the road okay you know? sure when you get on the road you know you got you know people from completely you know this came up completely differently you know yeah sure i'm and, sure you know, and uh you know chuck came from a you know a certain you know kind of family i came from a different kind of family and we get along great during the writing process but you know sometimes you get on the road and sometimes you find out things about each other that you 
because you're, you know, when you're writing, you know, you get to go home, you know, like I, I think I spent one night a week at Chuck's house during the whole writing process. Mm, okay. Sure. And, and uh, but you know, then we get on the road, you're spending every night together, you know, every yeah. day, every moment together. And, you know, you start, different. you know, when you're in your early twenties, you know, and you got more than one strong minded person, <laughs> in a yeah. group, it starts to become an issue, but certainly that was not the case with the writing. He was very, very, very easy to write with it. Very easy to get along with during that time. You know, yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, you know, and I'm sure I was too. And you know, I gotta, I want to qualify because I've sort of alluded to the fact that things got weird on on the tour. Um, I don't want to come off sounding like I'm pointing a finger, mm-hmm, you know, okay. because if I were, if I'm going to point a finger at somebody, I also have to take my other hand and point the other, you know, another finger at myself. Sure, you know, I was a, uh, I was young and headstrong, you know, <laughs> I was in my yeah. early twenties. And, uh, I have my own ideas about things, you know? Yeah, sure. And, uh, so I, I was, you know, I was headstrong and, and, uh, I'm sure that, uh, from his point of view, I was being quite the dick. And, and, and <laughs> when I look back, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe that, that yeah. was maybe dickheaded. Of course, then I would point at things that he did, and, you know, in my opinion, you know, it was, well, that was dickheaded that he did that. You know what I mean? And, sure. You know, sure. That's what happens when you're out on the road and you're young, you know? Yeah, it's of just, course personality sometimes clash but I, I'm, I'm certainly not pointing a finger of blame you know away from myself at least certainly not without pointing the other one back at me yeah, yeah. i got you man i know because it sounds it, we're listening to it you know it sounds like you guys were having a good time like I, uh, the song low life um i think is the one oh, with, yeah with yeah. uh the like soloing were you guys kind of soloing back and forth on that one yeah think, yeah, yeah yeah i believe so if i, if I, I mean it just comes off we so do a, smooth we do a trade-off yeah yeah, yeah me and me and chuck styles really complimented each other really well at that time and i know you know he, he told me at the time that you know he he wanted a guitar player in the band that would drive him and push him to be better and that he felt that i was you know that i mm. did the bill really well in that regard and that's cool uh, you know I, and i honestly do believe that we that album was the album the first death metal, full on death metal album that came out and showed the world, hey, it's cool to play good solos, melodic solos. Right. On a death metal record. And, yeah. You know, I actually had a couple of the guys from Carcass tell me that one time that that sort wow. of that album gave them the confidence to start doing that on their record. That's records. really cool. And I think, and they really started with that on, I think, like their third disc, Necroticism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, it, and it only went from there, like, you know even even more and because those guys are great guitar players you know yeah and uh um but i think you know prior to that album people just thought you had to fucking yank on the whammy bar like Kerry <laughs> King, you know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, oh, yeah uh, that's what's yeah i mean that's what's fact, cool about it man i mean like the it, it's the you know listening to it now it sounds like such a transitional album adding in the melodies and all that you know did it is that something that do you think that was a big part of just you coming into the band with that yeah uh, i mean i don't it was a really weird story how I got the gig. I mean, okay. I think Chuck was growing tired of the whammy bar thing. Okay, sure. Uh, of course, he didn't play them. He didn't even have a bar on his guitars. But, you know, his second guitar player at the time, Rick, you know, that's Rick's shtick, you know? Mm-hmm. And Rick's really good at it. And, you know, absolutely no, I'm not throwing any shade when I say that, you know, Rick was a whammy bar guy. Because, you know, Rick was kind of the whammy bar king. And, you know, and uh, and uh, you know he owns that and he's good at it. You know, okay, and, yeah. uh, it, it, it's definitely coming from a good place in me. You know, I'm, I'm, I think that there's a place for that and I think it sounds great. And I think he did a great job. Like I, oh, I, sure. I love Rick's stuff on, on, on leprosy. I mean, I didn't, I didn't play it because Chuck didn't want me to. And, uh, uh, it wasn't really my style to go that crazy on whammy bar. I use it. I use it a little bit more expressively mm, okay, with, within sure. a melodic context. But when I, Ran into those guys one time. I I had already done a tour with the band Agent Steel, right. so I had sort of started my career as a as a touring musician by getting a touring gig in the band Agent Steel. It was right before their I think second album, their third release because they had an EP as well. I think mm-hmm. uh, for Combat Records back in the day, back in 1987, their album Unstoppable Force was about to be released, and they relocated from LA to Florida. And they started advertising for a guitar player. And that happened to be the time that I was looking really hard to find a band, you know? Yeah. And I, I found their ad on the old Thoroughbred Music in Tampa, which was sort of a legendary place, you know, <laughs> right on Hillsboro Avenue. And so many bands started there. So many good guitar players were. Ralph Santala used to teach there. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah. I used to run into Ralph there all the time. So I've been knowing Ralph for 
31 years. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd go there, I'd see those guys and, and, uh, they had a bulletin board because this was obviously, this was 1987. It was way before the internet, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, or cell phone, you know, no average person having a cell phone, you know? Right. Yeah. Like bit, some wealthy business people had those big old bricks that gave them brain cancer. Yeah. <laughs> um, after three uses. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, no one had cell phones. No one had certainly no smartphones, definitely no internet. You know, that probably blows the mind of some of your younger listeners, you know, thinking about a time before internet, like what, right. How did you, <laughs> comp- did you do anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we were used to it, you know? So yeah, uh, yeah. I know I wanted to look for a, if I, I wanted to look for bands, I couldn't hop online, you know, couldn't, couldn't roll out of bed in my PJs and stroll over to my computer. I had to get mm-hmm. up, take a shower, get dressed and drive my ass all the way to Tampa. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. From Lakeland. And, and go in there and, and, uh, look at the bulletin board. And then I, I saw spotted this ad and I, it had the little tear strips on the bottom where you take scissors and you cut it all the way across the bottom in little vertical strips. And each one of those little strips has phone number on it. You know? Yeah. And yeah, it just said right. that, a that, a, a, a combat records band didn't name the band was looking for, uh, a, a guitarist to go on their upcoming tour in support of their about to be released new album. Mm. you know in the uk and europe and i was just like wow let me get one of these yeah and there were there were several more strips on there you know and i said yeah. hey let me go ahead and cut down the competition <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Smart>. <laughs> throw the rest Smart. of them away you know <laughs> and, and uh, uh i answered and i i ended up getting the gig and it turned out to be the band agent steel and the reason why i bring this up because it's kind of pertinent to how i got into death and how i met chuck and how i got to know these okay. guys because i uh I got that gig and I went over and I did the tour and, uh, that's, that's all I, I, you know, I wasn't sure whether I was going to stay in the band beyond that. I mean, I did write a song with them Mm -hmm. and it is on, uh, a live album that eventually came out from our show at the Hammersmith Odeon. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, uh, that was my first professional quote unquote, you know, band experience. They, They were signed to, you know, the original combat records and, uh, uh, which is the same label as, as death. And, and nuclear assault and a bunch of other really cool bands right. back in the day. And, uh, so the album was already done though. So I didn't play on the album, but it came out right at the top beginning of that tour. Just as we started the tour, it, it, it was released. And, uh, we went and toured Europe with uh, nuclear assault opening for us, believe it or not. Wow. Wow. And, uh, yeah, uh, agent still had more releases at that point And, uh, uh, or this, something like that. I don't know was considered for some reason a headliner when nuclear sure. assault wasn't, I don't really know why. And, uh, but you know, we, you know, we had tour shirts the whole nine. And of course I got my share of them. And, and when I came back to the States and carried on about my business, cause I didn't want to stay in that band, I had no desire or plan. Yeah, of to. course. So, uh, I, I basically just started teaching guitar lessons and, uh, looking for a band again. And ni- that was 1987, that tour. And in 1988, I went into Tampa for a show at the sunset club which doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, and it was death and they were supporting leprosy. And, uh, I had seen those guys before, but I had never really talked to them, mm-hmm. you know? And I certainly had never really met Chuck. I had seen the other guys around, you know, but I kind of knew what his voice was like a bit from him talking on stage, mm-hmm. you know, okay. and, and whatever on uh, some of the small shows that I had seen. So I went to this, I went to this show and, uh, I had decided that night to wear one of the Age of Steel shirts that I got on the tour mm-hmm. uh, that I had done. And so I'm wearing this Age of Steel shirt. It's only a year old, so it looks nice and new still. And I'm, I get out of my car and I'm, I talk to a few people and then I head for the door of the Sunset Club. Lots of people are still milling around outside. It's still day, it's still pretty light outside. And, uh, as I'm almost to the door, I hear, cool shirt, dude, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> Why do I kind of recognize that voice? Kind of sounds like a yeah. California beach guy, like a surfer <laughs> dude or something. And I, I turn around and look at who it was, and it was Chuck. He was standing there talking to a couple of fans, I guess. You know, right, right. Sure. And uh, I'm like, oh, hey man, how's it going? You know, <laughs> like, oh, good to meet you. You know, we just started talking, and from there, I met the rest of the band. We hung out a couple of times during that night, and uh, I actually was doing some uh, uh, interviewing here and there for a Dutch fanzine, and. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so I said, well, hey, let me interview you real, real quick for this Dutch fancy. So I did. And uh, we went across the street to do that. A couple of pictures against a building over there. And we're just shooting the crap. But during the course of this, I had kind of noticed that Chuck, Bill and Terry were a little bit snubbing Rick. Mm, not okay. too blatantly, not too openly. He really acted like he kind of could see it, but didn't care. You know, OK, yeah, he would just kind of whatever, dudes, you know, and, and walk away, you know. And I would see them guys kind of roll their eyes. And I thought, well, that sucks. You know, definitely yeah. sucks for Rick. That, that's a bad dynamic. But who knows? I don't know. I don't really know any of these guys. Maybe there's just cause for it, you know. And yeah. you know what? If I know that if I were running a band, you know, if I, if I had my own band and there was someone that I felt like I had to roll my eyes about, you know, they probably wouldn't be in the band long. You know, so I thought right. maybe, you know, who knows? So I said, hey, guys, you know, not not to overstep any boundaries here or anything and stick my nose into anything but you know if for some reason you guys were to ever part with rick here's my phone number and i think terry took it and stuck it in his pocket but you know chuck right off the bat when i started talking to him when he caught me at the door was like oh you're that guitar player that got the he asked he asked me where i got that shirt and i said well i basically earned it you know touring with the band he goes oh are you you're that guitar player i heard about that got the gig you know and i was like yeah so he already knew and it, and it turns out Chuck was a big Age of Steel fan, huge Age of Steel okay, fan, loved sure, them. Yeah. Loved them. So, he, and he knew the guitar player that I replaced, and he knew that guy was really good. To be and it was the guy's name was Bernie Vers- Versailles. I think just okay. like the just I think pretty much just like the city in France, Versailles. Yeah. And Bernie was in fact really really good, and no joke, Bernie blew me away back then. I could barely do passable, barely passable versions of his solos. When okay. I won that game, he yeah. smoked, he smoked me, but trying to learn those helped improve me. Like it improved sure. me. It actually helped me, you know, made me a better guitar player. But Chuck, Chuck I guess knows Chuck you figured, can handle it. Wow. You can handle Bernie Versailles, you know, solos. You must mm-hmm. be pretty damn good. So when I, at the point that I, you know, ha- had he not had that sort of background in his mind, me offering my thing, they probably would have just have politely taken it and it would have been lost, you know, Yeah. but they, had a clue that perhaps I actually could play, you know? Right. Yeah. And, sure. and, and they clearly were not completely happy with Rick. So they held on to it. So shortly after that gig though, I moved to Atlanta because I wanted to go to the Atlanta Institute of music, which at the time was like a little, it was like a sister school of, uh, or a daughter school, if you will, of uh, GIT out in LA. Okay. Which I think was still called GIT at the time, guitar Institute of technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go to that school. So, I, through some mutual connections, I met the guys, I, I, I met Dave Stewart of, of Hollow's Eve over the phone. He was looking for a roommate and, and possibly someone to jam with him in a, in a resurrection of Hollow's Eve. And so I moved to Atlanta, moved into a, a rental house with him and, uh, met the other guys in Hollow's Eve. We started jamming and I started, I went and did the tour, did the orientation at, G, at, uh, at, uh, AIM. And then I got a job as a landscaper and uh, I quickly realized I was never going to be able to save the money to go to AIM as a landscaper. Oh yeah, sure. But I was jamming with Hollow's Eve. So I thought, Oh, well, you know, at least my chosen career path is not totally lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm still doing something. And out of the blue, Chuck called me, he said, Hey man, we got, we, we, we fired Rick. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, I was like, wow. And, uh, but you won't believe this. Now, I've told this story before, but, uh, I actually turned him down. I told him. Really? That. Yeah. I told him, you know, and I you were a I fan would, at this point, would, correct? Yeah. A big fan. Big fan. Of yeah. Band, of course. Yeah. I had both. I had Scream and Leprosy. I loved the band. Okay. Sure. And, uh, uh, but I, t- I said, but I'm jamming with these guys, you know, with Hollow's Eve now. We're not really sure whether we're going to call it Hollow's Eve or not. It's still up in the air, but we're jamming. We're writing music. It's, coming going along good i and i just yeah. moved here like five months ago i'd hate to just let these guys down and so i get off the phone with him he's like okay well you know sorry to hear that but good luck and and uh you know that's cool that you're loyal you know yeah sure take it easy you know and uh so i got off the phone with him and uh and dave like i said dave from from hollow's eve was my roommate and uh he asked me uh so how'd it go what was what because he's the one who he's the one that took the call i was in my bedroom you know, oh, okay. and he comes knocking on my door and goes, Oh, Hey dude, uh, I think 
Chuck from death is on the phone for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So when I got right. off the phone, he was naturally curious how it had went. And uh, I said, he basically told me that the gig in death was mine. You know, if I wanted to come, you know, it would be kind of a tryout, but he was pretty confident in my ability, you know, come on down, yeah. you know. And, uh, you know, it, it was subject to a tryout, but he also expressed confidence that I'd be able to past the tryout whatever sure um so i told him i said well he offered me to try out for death and almost guaranteed position unless i just go down there and completely blow it but uh i told him that i'm you know committed to working with you guys you know and i was expecting i think i think i was expecting oh cool man that's awesome yeah what i got was are you fucking crazy <laughs> are you fucking you went crazy around it the right way though you, you got a chance to play that. in death and you turn it down so <laughs> I immediately went and tried to call Chuck back. Yeah. Well, he had, well, you got again, this was 1989 at this point. Okay. 1989. I had, I had moved to Atlanta and, uh, there was people still didn't have cell phones, man. It was still 10 years mm-hmm. away from people starting to have cell phones. And, uh, so I called and I reached his house and his mom answered <laughs> and she goes, Oh, I'm sorry, Chuck. You know, she didn't know who I was from Adam then, you yeah. know. It's like, oh, sorry, Chuck. You know, Chuck left. I don't, I don't really know when he's going to be back. Poss- he might have gone to his girlfriend's or, or out to rehearsal or something. And you know, he's either won't be back till late tonight or, or tomorrow sometime. And uh, you know, late tonight. Okay, he lives with his mom. I won't be able to call late tonight. Yeah. You, know, you wake yeah. up, old people. You know, they get mad. <laughs> you know, so I figured I just got to call him tomorrow. So I uh, waited till the next day and I called him and uh, I caught him and he goes. Yeah, well, what I did after I got off the phone with you, man, was I called this other guy we had as like a backup in case you didn't work out. Mm. This guy Mike, Damn. and uh, yeah, and uh, so then where I went last night after that was to rehearsal to try him out, and he came down and he played and he was really good, and we all got along with him really good, and we told him already he has the gig. And yeah. I was just like, oh, I was crestfallen, bummer. you know, it was <laughs> yeah. a total bummer. And I just said, uh, I said, look, I've already told my because that was like a friday and uh, i said uh, i i already told my work that i was gonna uh uh you know i already i had already taken the day off mm, okay, I, said, yeah. I, I had already already took the day off from my work and already planned to drive down there today be there for the weekend and try out for you guys you know yeah, see how it goes yeah. come back up and get my stuff if it works out well uh i didn't really have much stuff it would all fit in my car anyway so it didn't matter yeah. Um, so I'm going to come down anyway. I've already told my family I'm coming everything. I didn't think you guys would, you know, fill the spot that quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm already coming. So I'd love to at least meet with you guys somewhere. I can play for you. So just in case this guy doesn't work out, you'll already know that. Yeah. You, you can do have, it. That I, that I can do it. You. And he said, well, I mean, okay, you can come if you want, but we've already got our guy I think it's going to work out, but they weren't averse to meeting with me and hanging out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they had me come over to, I believe it was Terry's house, came to Terry's house and, uh, we were hanging out in Terry's room. We shot the shit for a while. It was just me, Bill, Terry and Chuck. And, uh, so then before I left, I set up my boom box and I had this little thing called a Tom Schultz rock man. And it was kind of like what, you know, kids might equate today to like a line six pod. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of those little things you can just play guitar into without an amp, yeah. you know, and, and uh, I was a, this, this particular boom box had a way in boom boxes. Yeah. People have people listening to this. Probably <laughs> anyone under anyone under 30 right now, probably like, what? a what? Yeah. What the hell is that? You know? <laughs> a what box? <laughs> uh, had a boom box and I, I had uh, you know, leprosy and, and, and scream on cassette. And I had a way to inject. It had like an input where you could sort of inject something and mix it with it. And so I was able, or I had a little practice amp, something. And so I, I, I set it up, played the tape, and I just played along with it right there in Terry's bedroom. And I played along with like four or five songs. When it came to the solos, I knew Chuck was was over the bar solo, so I didn't even put the bar in my guitar. Oh, okay. And uh, I just I played. Just my own solos whenever it would be Rick playing. So I just had to play over them. But I played the yeah, songs yeah. and I, I guess I played them really good. And I guess he liked my soloing. And, and they were like, yeah, dude, wow, you're really good, man. You know, um, 
yeah, I mean, I guess we'll call you if something happens, but you know, it was kind of implied, uh, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, mostly it was just to hang, you know, looking at records and listening to some records and stuff. And, uh, yeah, sure. Back when people used to actually get together <laughs> 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 yeah. and, uh, uh, do that kind of thing. And, uh, so I left and went back up to Atlanta. I mean, I was just really bummed out, you know? Yeah, of course. About the whole thing. And, uh, I think I was back like three, four days and I was back working at the landscaping job. And, uh, all of a sudden, you know, here comes, I kind of distantly hear the phone ring. Here comes Dave on my door again. Oh, it's Chuck again, dude. It's, it's, it's evil Chuck again, dude. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I went and picked up the phone. I was like, Oh, Oh wait, what's up? And he goes, dude, Mark did not work out. He just did uh, not. It just, and I was just like, well, what happened? Did playing or put, no, he played good, but he just, you know, he was just unreliable. You know, he, he, he canceled two rehearsals in a row. Like oh, he, there you go. He, he you know, for like his second and third rehearsals ever with the band, he called in, Oh, I'm not going to be able to make it. I got this or that. Yep. Going on. Yep. And they were just like, Oh, um, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. And sure. they, they called me and said, dude, you've already tried out. You've got the gig right on. <laughs> just come on down. And I was like, I'll be pack. I'm going to start packing my car as soon as I get off the phone with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I packed my guitar. I, I packed my car. Uh, the, the guys all, uh, the, the, uh, Hollow's Eve guys and some of our friends, um, which were mostly the guys in a band called Nihilist. Obviously okay. not, obviously yeah. not the Swedish Nihilist. It was the U.S. Right. Georgia Nihilist, who was yeah. like sort of a, a thrash slash death type band. Mm-hmm. Very, very heavy on the thrash elements in that band. But, uh, interesting story is Richard and Britt Turner from the bass player and drummer, respectively, of not, of the U.S. Nihilist are still active today in music. They are the rhythm section of, uh, Blackberry Smoke. The oh, Southern no Rock Band, the Southern, wow. the Southern Rockers Blackberry Smoke. Yeah. 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 I know. And, what you're talking uh, about. so they're still, they're still doing it too. And, uh, you know, they all sort of threw me a little party and, uh, then I woke up the next day and hopped in my car and took off. And, right, uh, man. <laughs> was in death and immediately just started, immediately in, entered into the rehearsals for spiritual and immediately started writing. And that's sort of how that happened. And uh, if there was anything else that I was trying to get to as the end came of that ginormously long story, I've forgotten it. <laughs> that's okay. No, man, I, I, that's an awesome story, man, just to hear that. And I can't imagine how stoked you were, you were just driving down there. I mean, you're already a big fan of this band. And oh, yeah. They were already making waves, you know. They oh, were and I knew, at that point. I knew that they were writing an album. And, yeah. that, you know, they had a deal. I had their other two albums. I had them on cassette. Yeah. You know, and I was just like, okay, this is real. I'm finally going to actually, for real, I've started the tour. You know, I've done a tour of the UK and Europe, but, you know, and, uh, yeah. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. Now, I, I was curious, did you follow any of the stuff after you were on any of the death albums afterwards or did you, did you, not, you know? not for years, not for years, you know, okay. um, I started focusing on my own thing. Um, yeah. you know, so I, was, well, I, I went right into obituary and then, and then, you know, then I started immediately working on disincarnate material and, you know, disincarnate was really during that whole time where my heart was at. Yeah, sure. You know, and, uh, it's just the thing about disincarnate is we, we sort of, that album came out in 93 and if you remember 93 it was like it was like the death metal apocalypse yeah it was going downhill yeah Yeah, bands were getting dropped left and right roadrunner dropped almost every band they had the only Mm -hmm. ones they didn't drop at that time were like i think obituary and deicide yeah okay everybody else got dropped and uh they stopped signing death metal bands everyone kind of stopped signing death metal bands they started Mm -hmm. looking for their uh, all those labels started looking for their own grunge you yeah, know? yeah. Like I think, you know, like Roadrunner signed like Grunt Truck and like Tad or something like, you know, some stuff like that, you know. And uh it was very dicey whether we were gonna get a second record. It was okay, very dicey. Yeah. You know, because uh sales, you know, for death metal went down across the board. I remember it was just such a weird phenomenon because you would wonder, well, why would it affect death metal sales? Well, the people who yeah. like death metal like death metal, right? But and that's what you would think, and that's what I would have thought you know, I I would still be scratching my head about that, except mm-hmm. I learned something about the fickle nature of people and the average music fan. Now, obviously, there's a lot of dedicated metalheads that have yeah, sure. just never stopped loving metal. They maybe have different periods and they might have had lulls and whatever, but they love metal their whole life, you know. Yeah. But I worked at a record store during that time, 
There's all that time, death, obituary, and disincarnate. You know, I worked at Aces Records in Tampa, Florida. And okay. uh, I saw, starting in like probably 92, and definitely going strong in 93, people that I had sold many, many, many a metal album to coming in all of a sudden wearing Doc Martens and a flannel shirt. <laughs> okay, yeah. That I'd only ever seen wearing like metal shirts. Wow. Come in wearing Doc Martens, a flannel shirt over a Pearl Jam shirt or something, yep. or a Nirvana shirt, and selling their selling or trading their death metal and metal collections to get, you know, Pearl Jam yeah. and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and, and all the other bands like that, you know, Smashing Pumpkin, yeah. you know, whatever. I mean, plus, plus it, the whole black metal thing going on too, I'm sure. That, that really didn't start making a dent until like 94. 95 okay. that's when it really that's when it really started making a dent in the u.s yeah it was making waves in europe no doubt at that mm-hmm. point but europe never really caved it you know never really europe's not as fickle europe fans are not as fickle as a lot as, right. as the average american fan is you know like i said there's luckily a very strong contingent of very dedicated fans who know what they like and they're gonna like it no matter what's popular but yeah death metal was definitely on a at a peak and you know because as it got more popular a lot of the more Fickle people sort of, you know, bought into it. And then immediately, as soon as grunge started becoming popular, that's what they figured they were, you know. And I, I'm not, hey, I like a lot of the grunge bands, you know what I mean? I sure. love Alice yeah. in Chains, you know, and I, yeah. I'm one of the rare people that, from metal that actually kind of, I like Spurl Jam. Yeah. You know? Okay. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I recognize, you know, Eddie Vedder sings like a Billy Goat, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, you yeah. know, I, I, I kind of like Pearl Jam, but, you know, I don't play that kind of music. I'm not influenced yeah. by that kind of music, but I can appreciate those bands for what they are. But yeah, yeah, but that kind of explains what happened. Like literally people who were buying metal stopped. Mm hmm. Spell off. <laughs> yeah, you can see how that would be hard to keep the band, you know, going to try and do another album and all that. Yeah, that would it was be, really uh, rough. hard time. We, yeah. And we went out and did the tour and it was it was rough. I had done multiple successful tours in the u.s with death and obituary i had done Mm -hmm. a big tour in the u.s with death and i had done two big tours in the u.s with obituary and yeah they were they were very successful and i certainly hoped for better but of course you know i knew it was going to be a hard slog i I told the guys in the band you know first couple tours might be pretty hard but i was i still wasn't really factoring in what what grunge was doing to the musical landscape and so it, it was a really really hard rough rough tour and It's one of those tours that today more people claim to have seen one of the shows than ever showed up at those shows. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, sure. (laughs) And and to be fair, probably some of them just really don't remember those. (laughs) They were (laughs) pot and alcohol haze back then. They they think they went to the show, but they didn't. But, uh, uh, you know, there were shows that were really successful and some shows that were very sparsely attended. But it was really rough. So when we came back from that tour and it had gone so kind of tough we definitely came back in the red and uh which was tough for us because no one had money you know yeah of course we came back for all personally in the red you know the rest of my band were kind of young guys they started thinking well they didn't know this is their first tour they hadn't they didn't know anything so that yeah they were worried about well we're really young you know our family still want us to go to college maybe we should do that you know (laughs) like yeah yeah okay you know and uh, Roadrunner is saying, well, we don't necessarily want to exercise the option for the next record. Uh, we'll, mm. let's, we need to hear a demo, you know? Oh, okay. You yeah, know, yeah. You know, of course, back then, though, they gave you the money because you had to go to a studio to do a demo. So they were going to finance a demo, but it never got to that point because as things were just sort of falling apart and I wasn't really sure what was going to happen with the band, whether we were even going to have a deal, um, that's when I got the call. From Testament. Right, right. And yeah, yeah. what are you going to, yeah, obviously yeah. you're going <laughs> to like, take that call. Well, Testament's one of my favorite thrash bands ever, so yeah, I'm definitely doing that. <laughs> In fact, yeah. I had I had a small handful of uh, cassettes with me on that, in, with my Walkman on that tour I did with Agent Steel, and one of them was The Legacy. Okay, yeah. And yeah. uh, uh, another one was King Diamond Abigail. And uh, <laughs> trying to remember some of the others, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Death. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, Scream yeah. Bloody Orc was one of them. So. Right, right. 
So yeah, so it was it was definitely a weird thing. Now, man, I'm I'm late to go for my for my job here, but I gotta ask one more. Just since you brought up Testament, I mean, when you did jump into the band like that, I'm sure you've been asked before, but was that a nervous thing for you to do? I mean, were, was there a lot of pressure jumping into a huge band like that and contributing? It, you know, at that point, I had just been busy, busy, busy in the business. I had made let me count one, two, three, four albums. I had played on four full albums as a contributing musician and or writer, you know, and, you know, or, and writer, you know, um, because, you know, I wrote music, I I wrote and played on spiritual healing. You know, I played on, uh, cause of death. I played on, uh, death shall rise by cancer. And then I wrote and played on, you know, my own disincarnate album. So this was my 90, 91, 92, 93. I had four years. I had done four albums and a rook of tours, yeah, I had just been on the road. When I wasn't on the road, I was in the studio. So I was at the absolute top of my game. Okay, and uh, yeah. I, mean, I was, I was, ready. I was honed razor sharp. So mm-hmm. I, I, I had a great deal of confidence. I, I'm not going to, you know, try to front and say I wasn't nervous. I definitely <laughs> was. I wanted yeah. that gig. I wanted, you know, I, I definitely wanted that gig. But I knew that I could play Skolnick stuff, and I knew. Yeah that they were going to want someone who would actually play Skolnick stuff properly because mm-hmm. and they basically told me, yeah, you need to be able to play Skolnick stuff because his solos are like iconic to the songs. So, you yeah, know, the, yeah, the fans expect to hear them. They don't want to hear your, you know, when I was in death and obituary, I didn't play Rick stuff or Alan stuff yeah, and nobody wanted me to not the mm-hmm. bands and not the fans. They wanted to yeah. hear, you know, maybe a few of the fans, you know, really, because like I said, Rick was really good at his bar stuff, you know, and, and some mm-hmm. of those solos are re- really cool, you know, uh, for what, you know, for just good examples of uh, having a mastery of that kind of bar playing. Of but so possibly there were some, but uh, in the overall, you know, they wanted me to improv. So I, I just improvised. I Those solos, I improvised every night. I just came up with something off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, 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 but going into Testament was a completely different deal. You know, it was yeah. like these solos, people want to hear people them. People expect yeah. to hear them and you have to play them note for note. So they gave me like a list of like eight or nine songs to learn. I think something like that, maybe 10. And uh, I had, uh, I think, like a week to do it. And wow. uh, they also <laughs> sent me a four track, you know, from a four track, you know, multi-track take a, a cassette that was bounced down with like, I think the mix on two of them, you know, stereo, it mm-hmm. takes up two of the tracks if it's stereo. And then I had two tracks open to record a solo. Eric mm-hmm. sent me that. And I, I luckily had a four track, you know, a compatible four track player, no big deal. I popped it in and it, what it was, was an early demo version. I think it was like drum machine even of uh dog face gods from the low. Okay, yeah. And so yeah, I, right. I had to, he wanted me to write and record a solo and send him the tape back, let him hear it. So I did it. And that solo that I did on that early demo version of Dogface Gods is pretty much exactly the same solo. I recorded it exactly the same when I actually did the wow. album session. And, yeah. uh, but he loved the solo. So that made them decide to fly me out. And when they flew me out, they gave me a list of songs to, to audition with. And, uh, I, I just sat, I remember I, I, I left my Tampa apartment, let that go. Uh, cause I, I, I was so confident that I just let that go. And I, yeah. I, I came back, I, 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 uh, moved back to Lakeland, moved into my mother's house, basically just took up living in her living room, made it my rehearsal place and, and learning, you know, din. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, I sat there all day long while they were at work. And then I would take up again after they went to bed, practicing the songs, learning them and practicing them. Yeah. And sure. then I flew out. Hurst got the gig and I, I was, wow. I was definitely nervous. I wasn't, I was unsure whether I had it or not, you know? And, yeah. uh, it, I, I remember we went around the corner from the rehearsal space to, uh, this very typically California, uh, little cafe restaurant and, uh, ordered some weird food that I had never had before being from Florida. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the sort of weird sort of esoteric artisan sandwiches and stuff. And yeah. I got it. <laughs> what is this crap? I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it tasted good. And, uh, so we shot the shit. And they, the, the, the thing was, we weren't done. We were going to go back and, and play the last couple of songs and, and wrap up. So the plan mm-hmm. was, well, we're just, we're hungry. Let's go get food. 
and uh, we went and got food. And uh, at some point, I, w- I went to the bathroom. I was like, oh, I got to take a leak. Right back. You know, I took a leak. I came out, and they were all just sitting there looking at me weird. They were all just staring at me. <laughs> and they're like, Chuck goes, well, we've kind of already kind of came to a decision. And he sounded like he was trying to let me down easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it amongst ourselves, and uh, he was just kind of shaking his head, kind of <laughs> looking down, uh, you know? Yeah. You know, as, like, if, oh, shit. as if oh, I got to break bad news to somebody. This sucks, you know? And then he said, and we decided, and he just looked at me, that you got the gig. <laughs> and I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm right. There you go. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> well, man, uh, I'm, you've got a lot of amazing stories. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome. I wish I could keep asking more. I've got so many other questions I could oh, yeah, ask yeah. you. But... I didn't let you get to most of your questions, huh? Sorry about no, that. <laughs> this was better, man. This was much better. <laughs> yeah, awesome you know, stories. You, you caught me on a good day, well, uh, kinda, or, you know, if quote unquote good day. It depends on your yeah. interpretation of it, but I, I can I can uh, run off at the mouth sometimes when I'm talking about all those old yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah. You need, you need to write a book or something, man, with all those uh, <laughs> yeah, stories yeah, and experiences. Ultimately, I will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but man, I got to run. So I really appreciate it, man. And like I said, I uh, hope to see here some, uh, some more disincarnate or, or something like that from you in the future. And if you do, you know, we'll be there for it. So right on. Thanks, Jason. Take care.